we begin a discussion with a public health scientist in the United States. As the world grapples with a public health crisis of an unprecedented scale in the 21st century, scientists across the globe are working day and night to develop an effective vaccine. As of now, there are around 70 research groups worldwide working on over 100 potential vaccines in different stages of development. This week, the first results of human trials by US-based Moderna Therapeutics offered a glimmer of hope. Out of the 45 volunteers in the study, eight were found to have produced key antibodies that work against the virus. The news has been encouraging, but most members of the scientific community have cautioned that the development should be taken with a grain of salt and maintain that a vaccine is likely to take much longer than just a few months to hit the market. Now, to discuss the progress made so far in developing a vaccine for COVID-19, we connect with Dr. Eric Ding, a visiting scientist at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, Thank you, let's... happy to be here. Thank you. Well, let's start with Moderna's results this week. It seems that scientists have welcomed the news mostly, but many remain on the fence until there are more details provided about the test. Do you agree that there's yet un, um, insufficient information? That's right. Um, so far, we only have eight people out of 45 people in that small phase one trial. And we know eight, it's not that it didn't work for the other 37. It just, we didn't have the data in yet because all the eight people have neutralizing antibodies and neutralizing antibodies that can actually neutralize the virus is critically what we need to establish. So I'm hopeful for more data and there's many other uh, vaccines that have been successful in monkeys. So um, we're hopeful and there's many groups working on it. Well, Moderna, were, it was asked a lot of questions actually by reporters, um, including whether their vaccine generated a T cell response. And it seems that they gave no clear answers. And what do you make of that? They gave no clear answers because they weren't done. They rushed too much. And I think there's this excitement over vaccines that they want to be the first and they announced it with just eight people and it does take a lot of time to establish this and i think this is why we need to see the full paper it's not even published yet not even as a preprint so um we're hopeful but again um it eight, 45 people is still a small population we will still need to do phase two and phase three with thousands of people and that will take time and how durable or long-lasting would these uh, neutralizing antibodies have to be? Yeah, we, we know that uh, it will last at least a month or two to begin with. And there's different kinds of vaccines. Um, there's vaccines that are designed to last one year, and, and some hopefully it will last for a lifetime because well, how vaccines work, it trains your body to learn about the virus so that your B cells can pull it out of its library archives next time it encounters the virus. Now, how well your body remembers it is the question, but we know from experience and in monkeys, it does de definitely last for at least a couple months. And initially that will be enough. And I'm um, hopefully this will last potentially as a lifetime uh, vaccine. So the type of vaccine that Moderna is developing is a mRNA vaccine. And uh, what are the key characteristics of that kind of vaccine. Right, they're, 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 it's an MRA design uh, vaccine and there are also DNA design vaccine. It, it basically it trains the body to either recognize the antigens um, by building, by inserting into your body and having your body replicate the proteins on this virus, but without the actual dangerous part of the machinery of the virus. So it, it train, it's a, it's a, vaccines work by as a training program. And the better your, it trains your cells to recognize it, the better it is to fight it. Uh, and then again, there's many different kinds of vaccines. Um, and so hopefully this formulation will be successful. Um, but you know, the British group, the Jenner Institute are, will have a different system. And I think the more different types of vaccines we'll have, the more chance for success later on. Right, and while scientists have um, welcomed this development by Moderna, um, some say that it actually seems a bit too much of a coincidence, really, that Moderna's former executive was appointed to lead America's vaccine project. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, Moderna, by the way, has not actually put a successful drug on the market before. Um, and the, the new uh, expert as, as, as the chief vaccine, he's a venture capitalist. He's not. He's a scientist, but he's an investor and uh, venture capitalist first. And so I think that's part of the reason they rushed it out earlier this week, um, because they're also fundraising. So that actually makes things complicated because he has, you know, he actually personally got wealthy from his stock rising because of Moderna. And I wish they had someone who has completely no equity and stake in the vaccine that he's actually managing. But this is what the Trump administration has decided to do. And I hope for the sake of public health that, you know, they stay as unbiased as possible. Well, it does seem that Moderna's uh, process of developing a vaccine was very uh, fast tracked. And um, when we think about other uh, va attempts to develop a vaccine around the world, for instance, the University of Oxford, um, they were able to stimulate an immune response, but they couldn't prevent transmission. So why is it difficult to achieve both elements? I think there are just different aspects. There's one uh, preventing transmission as well as you know preventing severity. And and um, and basically, the most successful vaccines are that you could fight the uh, the uh, virus as as soon as it enters your body. And and um, the Jenner Institute uses a different capsid. That basically it's a vehicle for many different vaccines. Uh, it's a vaccine system. And it's a very different approach uh, that it, it trains your body, but we're hopeful. And General Institute thinks they will have 1 million doses by September, they say, they claim. I'll believe it when I see it, um, but uh, I'm hopeful. Well, there's also the fear that a vaccine could actually do more harm than good. What are the complications that scientists are trying to avoid during the development process? Yeah, there's something called, and it, it's rare, so called enhancement, that training the vaccine, uh, training the body about this, it actually enhances the effects of the virus against your body. That is rare, um, but this is what the phase one is looking for, the safety. Is there any enhancements? What is the proper dosage? Um, and perhaps if it's strong enough, you don't have to go with a high dose. You can do a low dose. And if you can do a low dose, you can give potentially to two, two times as many people because it's easier to manufacture a lower dosage. So all these kind of things we're trying to figure out if there's no enhancement and what is the necessary dose to achieve the antibody levels that you would see with someone who is immune. And the question that everyone's asking over and over, when do you think a vaccine will actually be out on the market? We will probably need a couple billion doses of this. Um, and so I think the initially we could have some ready by the fall for healthcare workers. Because we, we already have, we already know it works in monkeys, some of these vaccines. And for healthcare workers, I think we will get emergency use authorized by many countries. And that will be a couple million doses, um, but the actual ramp up will require enormous amount of time and resources. And that's why it will be about spring um, 2021. Right. Well, some doctors and patients, they, they're saying that um, remdesivir has been effective in treating COVID-19. Uh, what do you think about this? And is it possible that drugs like these could actually be uh, repurposed or adapted even before a vaccine comes out? Yeah, I think we will have more drugs and treatments um, uh, ready by the fall, late summer and fall. Desivir is moderately good. It reduces the duration of the illness from 15 days to 11 days, uh, but it actually did not significantly reduce the mortality. It barely did. If they held the trial longer, it may have shown a benefit. So. We can't for certain say that it reduces mortality. It just reduces illness duration by 31%. And I would say that's a very modest effect. But uh, if you think back to HIV, at the beginning when we had HIV or early drugs, they were also very modest. But eventually we came up with more and more drugs, then we combined them into a cocktail. And now HIV is completely manageable. And not saying this drug will be like HIV, but I'm saying that 
initial drugs, sometimes one drug alone won't be enough, but eventually you'll find a cocktail of drugs that will be very, very successful in treatment. Well, I'm sure everyone's really hoping to see some kind of you know, solution to this uh, epidemic that's yeah. going on. Well, it does seem that the absence of effective treatments, as well as the uh, hurdles to developing a vaccine, demonstrates the failure of government policy and bureaucracy in every country, really. How do you think government policies and regulations should actually change to provide consistent support for scientists? Yeah, I think the key thing is, you know, science, you know, you need the infrastructure, you need the, the pipeline of, of researchers and labs ready to deal with it. You know, Korea was really great uh, for their testing because your, your lab testing and your commercial testing infrastructure was there and you immediately were able to test hundreds of thousands of people. Meanwhile, US was very lagging and the US's lag led to the late development and perfection of the test. Um, so I think that's a perfect example of if you had funded the labs and the scientists along the way, you could quickly respond to the pandemic or any new emerging epidemic. And same with vaccines, vaccine development. You need the scientists in the pipeline ready to do this. And so the more we invest, the better. And an ounce of prevention literally is worth a pound of cure or a pound of disease deaths. And what about the consistency of research and um, funding for drug development? Yeah, that is always a tricky part because oftentimes in drug development, there's a, there's a patent protection, right? And some patents are not protected. But for example, remdesivir, China says, we can synthesize it. We don't need your formula. Um, and we're going to probably make it even without, even with your patent. So in drugs, in certain ways, you know, it's very tricky because remdesivir, in some countries, they say it might sell for $1,000 a dose. And that is way too expensive. And that will actually harm people if it's priced at that range. So there has to be in certain way a balance and most medical research is funded by governments so i do not personally believe that all of pharma profits belong to the companies because the public citizens taxpayers that funded the government research should benefit so i think there should be a cooperation here you know no scientist no drug from a pharmaceutical company was invented in a vacuum by the company alone Right. And well, until a vaccine is developed, in the meantime, uh, with the second wave coming as well, what can members of the public do to really make sure that our bodies are in tip top condition? I think I think the key thing is testing, testing and contact tracing. Um, Korea has really, really great testing and contact tracing. Um, if you have uh, been following the news, the rest of the world is very jealous of what Korea has done, been, uh, been doing in containing it and um but in addition i think mass funding masks for all not just cloth masks but potentially n95 masks for all will be really great as well as thinking about other technologies like uv far uv light, lights because far uv is very effective in killing viruses and it does not cause skin cancer like regular uv so potentially and new york city is already installing them in their subway cars Maybe we should have more far UV in public places as well as in the air filtration of businesses and, and large venues. All these different things we should start thinking about beyond just vaccines, distancing and testing. Well, it's definitely encouraging to hear that there are some things we can do to try and prevent the virus. Well, that's where we're going to have to wrap up our discussion, but we really appreciate your insights as well as your efforts to raise the level of public awareness on the facts that we need to know. Dr. Eric Ding, epidemiologist and health economist at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Thank you very much for joining the program. Thank you. Have a good day. This is also where we wrap up the program. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at the same time on Monday in Korea. Have a lovely weekend wherever you are. Goodbye.